Welcome to our video on shaping tensile spanning elements. This is from chapter one, section six. We're now at our fourth video, which we're calling 01.6.1-D uh, for tensile elements. In this case, we're not talking about connections or straight tensile elements, but we're talking about shaping tensile elements for purposes of spanning. So here we have a kind of bicycle chain and one of the reasons we like this is that each of these pins allows uh, an easy rotational motion so that uh, effectively even though this is a very strong and very heavy element um, and it has apparent thickness to it, it's actually extremely flexible because of the nature of all of these joints. Um, and, and what's happening actually under this continuous load, uh, there's more load uh, per horizontal dimension in this zone than there is here. So if we were to plot along the horizontal the load, it would be higher near the ends and somewhat smaller in the middle. The shape that this assumes under its own weight is called a catenary. If we had uniform load along the horizontal, which we'll talk about later, it would be a parabola. The two curves look very, very similar, but the catenary tends to be a little fuller near the quarter points. If we add a localized force, we create a very apparent cusp, meaning a change of direction. And, and the member has to respond, the suspension element has to respond to that force in this manner because it can only exert forces along its length and in order to create enough of a vertical component here these two elements have to be redirected so that uh, they can support this localized load. We call this change in direction a cusp and there's actually a tiny minute not very apparent cusp at every single joint because we have the load associated with this link for example as a sort of localized load it's just that there are so many of those loads and the transition from one joint to the next or from one link to the next is such a small angle change that we barely note it but it is a cumulative effect which is why we're able to achieve this apparent curvature is that at each joint we have a minute change in direction that gives us this apparently smooth curve. Here we have a fairly strong force which is creating a very apparent cusp. That cusp becomes even more dramatic as we add more load. Um, here we have two forces that are creating two cusps. There's a cusp basically at every localized force uh, this is a very apparent cusp. This is a more, even more apparent or more dramatic cusp when we add even more load. All right, so here we have three point forces, and um, so if we, and, and that produces three cusps. So if we think of this as a sort of a continuum, here we have one force with one cusp, two forces with two cusps, three forces with three cusps. And then you get enough of these together and the change in angle is so small you don't really see the cusp, you just see this apparent smooth curvature. And again, to make this point, if these uh, loads are uniform along the horizontal, and this was drawn deliberately to make that quite apparent, so each one of these little balls represents a force and they are clearly evenly spaced along the horizontal if we have that condition, then the shape for this uh, tensile element would be a parabola. When it's just hanging on under its own self-weight, the shape is a catenary. <clears throat> and later, uh, there will be a section in the book where we talk about the difference of these two things mathematically, but for right now, we're just sort of trying to uh, perceive the general shapes Okay, now in truth, we have cusps in our chain because we actually have pin joints there. We don't have precise cusps, though, if we have a cable or any kind of tensile member that doesn't have clear pin joints. In other words, a cable does have on a very local level some kind of bending resistance uh, 
and we don't want it to abruptly change direction because that would do damage to the cable. So we have what we re render here is if it was a point force, but if we take this intersection right here and we blow it up, we discover that actually there's a distributed stress there and there's some sort of element that helps that happen. And so the cable actually comes in and gradually changes shape and then goes out straight again. And likewise, we'll have a, uh, uh, a sort of saddle surface for this lower cable or the suspender cable. So this uh, stress dis is distributed by this forged metal connector. And you can see that here uh, in another situation. Here we have a kingpin truss with a straight member across the top. This is the kingpin. The tension cable is coming down and it's changing direction uh, oh, between this point and that point, changing direction gradually. So don't, we don't have a true cusp there. We have a somewhat gentle change in direction and this cable runs continuously through that connector. We can even see this at the really grand scale. This is a view of the Golden Gate Bridge, which uh, perceptually appears to have a cusp at the top of each of these towers. <clears throat> this is another view looking back towards the city of San Francisco. When we look locally, though, we discover <clears throat> that there's actually a curved saddle, which is very elaborately constructed to allow this cable to distribute its forces and change direction in a fairly gentle way. And this is a view in the perpendicular direction looking through that. So we have this smooth ca saddle and in the other direction we have curvature. Uh, so here we have curvature this way and in the perpendicular plane we have curvature in the other direction. <clears throat> now we can demonstrate a point and that is that in order to get structural action we have to have sag. <clears throat> so here we have two support points. Here we have a point where a load is applied. <clears throat> We're spanning between the two support points and in this case, this cord <coughs> uh, has a certain tension force in it, which is dictated by whatever load we've put on here. Uh, in, the ca in this case, the support elements are pulleys with a pin joint through the center. So they have very little resistance uh, tangentially. Um, so literally, all through this cable, the tension cannot change. Uh, it's uniform everywhere. And we have a certain sag here. In other words, as soon as we apply this load, we induce a sag. If we want to reduce that sag, we have to increase the tension in the cable. So if we increase the tension in, or the mass or weight in each of these two elements, um, quite dramatically, we've reduced the amount of sag here, but there still is some. Um, and you can't get rid of it. You know, you'd have to make these forces infinite in order to get enough tension that this would be horizontal and no material can resist inf infinite force. So one of the rules we have here is <clears throat> you have to have some sag and the less sag you have, the more you're going to have to tension your cable and that means the greater the structural burden on the cable. Now, some of you have seen <clears throat> examples of tight rope uh, walkers or walkers on cables, and those cables tend to be pulled very tightly. And when you look from the side, they appear to be uh, straight members, but when you look along the length, you actually see a rather dramatic amount of sag and the person who's walking is producing a cusp right at the point where that person is standing on the cable. And in fact, uh, that sag allows the person who's walking the cable to move the supporting foot back and forth from side to side as one of the techniques for maintaining balance. Okay. <clears throat> Same principles apply whether it's a point force or a bunch of distributed forces. Uh, in this case, we have a certain amount of sag. So if we projected a straight line across there and measured this dimension, that's the amount of sag. The 
end cable has to have a force tangential so there's a vertical force which is dictated by however much load is being supported and then there's a horizontal force which uh, allows us to have a resultant that's tangent to the direction of the cable. Um, cables and, and, and rope and things like that cannot produce forces perpendicular to the rope uh, except by creating a cusp. So at the end, in order to have the thing acting properly, the final support force on the suspension element has to be tangent to the end of that element. So if we have a fair amount of sag, the horizontal component may not be that large, but you'll notice in this case, the horizontal force is substantially larger than the vertical force and then the resultant total force is even larger than the horizontal force. Um, and this just shows a bunch of uh, various sags uh, for the suspension element uh, superimposed on top of each other. In each case we have a certain load which in this case is W over 2 where the rest of the W would have been on the other member we have a support force that has to be W over 2, the vertical force. That doesn't change as we change the sag, but what does change is the angle here, which produces, depending upon the amount of sag, the angle of the member at the end becomes more and more shallow. And in order to generate this full vertical force, we have to have more and more horizontal force. So all this tells us is less sag means much, much higher forces, which stresses the cables, but also uh, burdens whatever the support structure is that has to provide that horizontal force. So here's an example. We have a uniformly distributed load uh, projected on the horizontal, a pulley here and a pulley there and a certain amount of force that's required as the horizontal component in order to keep this structure stable. This force is fairly small because we have a very deep sag. When we go to a shallower sag, this force has to become much larger. So you'll notice the amount of load hasn't changed. We have one washer on each of these vertical suspenders, whether we're looking at this case or whether we're looking at that. But what's changed dramatically is with a really deep sag, we don't have much of a horizontal component, but here we have a whole lot more. Both of these uh, racks of, of uh, washers are hanging off of the, uh, the suspension cord at that point. Okay, so what that says is we'd like to have more sag in order to reduce the stress on the cable really, really shallow sag means very, very high stresses on the cable. On the other hand, uh, and it may also mean very high stresses in the structure that provides the horizontal component. So here we have a tension member that wants to pull inward and there's a strut across here. So we're going to go show that strut. This is a compression strut in the form of a truss, which makes it less vulnerable to buckling and also uh, gives it support under its own self weight um, and it basically is creating a horizontal force here so if I go pick a color I can see it's pushing outward on the cable there and pushing outward on the cable here and um, the shallower the cable is, the more force it needs, and so we're showing this truss is pretty thick and massive in this case. Um, over here, we have a much less massive truss because the shallow, I mean, the very deep nature of the suspension element means it doesn't need much of a horizontal force outward to keep it stable. So by going to this deeper proportion, we have reduced the uh, weight of the suspension member from this thick element to this thin one. We've reduced the weight of this compression element from really thick to much, much more delicate. But the price is we've now had to increase pretty dramatically the height of this support structure.
Um, and that means it's more vulnerable to wind, more vulnerable to buckling, and so forth. So we have some functional requirement for clearance here, and uh, then we have to increase depth above that point, and that depth is has a price associated with it, which is the additional amount of that vertical dimension. But also you'll notice that this element is thicker than this element because it's taller and more vulnerable to buckling. And if it has a role in resisting wind load, uh, such as cantilevering out of the foundation, then it has to be even thicker. So that concludes our discussion of shape for tensile elements. In summary, we say a fair amount of sag is required. And by the way, as a guideline, we would almost always say that this sag should be at least one-tenth of that span. And typically, we'd like it uh, even deeper than that. But if you start drawing things where this sag is less than a twentieth of this, you're just not designing a very good tensile structure. The second comment is that if we have a uniform load as projected along the horizontal, the appropriate shape is a parabola. If it's a suspension element hanging under its own self-weight, its appropriate shape is a catenary.